Hi, this is uh, Elevate episode seven. Um, I'm really proud to be joined with uh, Trevor Hirschfield, captain of the wheelchair rugby team, national team. Um, Trevor, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. No problem. We're, uh, we're squeezing this in on, uh, while our kids both nap. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, what, a, what a great place to start. How, how has parenthood changed your outlook and maybe your life as an athlete? There's a there's a lot less time for training, so trying to find times when I'm at home where I can I can get out and, and get a workout in is can be challenging, but uh, you know it's it's great. It's a great new challenge, and I'm I'm enjoying being a father. And what a place to bring the kids away on the island. Yeah, um, we we ended up moving back here, and uh, we couldn't be happier. We're close to our family and. Uh, it makes it nice when when I am traveling with rugby to to have family support and give us a place to drop the kids off when we need a break. Nice. Also, you have a lot of roots already here. Yeah, I uh, I grew up here and graduated from Bellina Secondary School in two thousand one, mm-hmm. and uh, moved to Vancouver two thousand eight to train. Yeah, and then the the training there just guys moved on guys retired so you know I was like you know I can do this same training at home on the island so my wife and I are both from the island Mm -hmm. so and obviously having the kids it made sense to move back and be close to family and have that support yeah so how is how do your coaches have an impact on your training remotely like this are they checking in on you are they setting tasks yeah, well, well, we are traveling when we are traveling with, and things are are normal, I guess you could say. Uh, where we are together quite a bit, and then uh, the program is decentralized, so there's a lot of guys throughout the country, and we have training programs. So uh, I work with uh, uh, an athletic trainer out of Nanaimo, and I see him a few times a week, and then I have. Uh, uh, monthly schedule sent to me of what to do and and it's pretty easy to follow and then we do uh, video meetings over zoom here we'll watch video and we'll break things down and we'll talk about concepts uh, when we're not together so doing a lot more of that now yeah obviously not having the opportunity to be together so we're we're on calls uh, maybe once twice a week different lineups talking about different things just so when things do get back to normal where we are able to, to you know, train and compete, uh, we'll hit the ground running. Do you guys use video analysis much within your gameplay? Yeah. Yeah, we use video analysis quite a bit, actually, uh, especially uh, breaking down our own strategies and, you know, strategies of other teams that we face and just looking at how our lineups match up and, and – uh, you know, maybe what we want to do offensively against certain lineups of other teams and, and defensively against those lineups. So we, we use it quite a bit, actually. It's uh, pretty key in being successful, being a successful team, I think. Yeah, I was just chatting with uh, the VI Raiders coach, Curtis Visa, recently. Um, we were just saying how it's more, it resonates more today with the, uh, the new generation coming through, too, because they can take a lot of empowerment and be self-aware using tools like this. Are you finding that with some of the new athletes? Yeah, I think, I mean, without it, you kind of maybe think you're, you're on track or you're doing the right thing or you're not making mistakes. And, and I think that it's a great tool to help, um, you know, challenge you and, and help you to grow as an athlete where you're able to watch yourself and, and you know, critique yourself um, in order to, to get better. And, and, and challenge yourself that way as well. So let's get into the uh, kind of the national team setup. Uh, you were a, you were a player a while before you assumed the captain role. Were you always a player that was um, that was seen as a potential captain, or is it something you had to grow into and you assumed them traits? Um, I, I don't think I was probably. I don't think I was seen as a captain. Uh, you know, I. I started on the team with a lot of great, great players and a lot of great mentors. And I kind of just, you know, 
um, listened to what they said and soaked up what they said. And um, from uh, just learning all the different aspects of the game to also um, carrying yourself as, as a representative of wheelchair rugby Canada and mm. the Canadian sport and, and just a person representing Canada and how important that was. And, you know, I pride myself on, on continuing that legacy that they, they put on to me and, and bringing that to the next generation of athletes. Um, and, and maybe it was that, that, you know, maybe a little more vocal, than, than some of the other other athletes, uh, and kind of may, uh, maybe put me into that that leadership role, um, but I enjoy it. I, you know, I, I take pride in in being an athlete that that uh, teammates will turn to and mm-hmm. and look upon in certain situations, and um, I'm, I'm proud to say that I think we've we've done a great job of carrying on the legacy of wheelchair rugby Canada. And, and I'm proud of how our newer athletes, our younger athletes are, are grasping that concept and going with it. Do you see a new hunger coming in with some of these athletes? Because the sport has taken so many strides over the last uh, decade. I do. I, th- I think our younger athletes are very hungry. Um, I think, I think a lot of our veteran athletes have done a great job of challenging them and not saying, mm-hmm. not just giving them, uh, giving them the reins to the cart. They've uh, actually challenged them to become better athletes and say, yeah, you're, you're here, you're younger, you maybe you're stronger, you're faster, but we're smarter. So you're yeah. going to have to work hard to, to take these, these jobs of ours. And um, I think it's only helped make our team better. One thing you do is uh, you, you really take care of that gritty side of the game. You're looking after those high point, high point scorers on the, on the opposition. Um, that must be, in terms of decision making, there must be a lot going on. You're trying to do your, do, do your right thing for your team and cover your bases there, but you're also taking care of their, their star athlete. How, how do you cope with that? Do you have a mechanism in play or does it come in instinctively? I think a lot of that comes instinctively now, uh, based on how I uh, I approached the game early on. I mean, I think it goes a lot back to video. Yeah. And um, I spent a great deal of time watching video with with Ian Chan, who is you know a great athlete for Wheelchair Rugby Canada and mm-hmm. and one of the best athletes in the world. And he just he was a very smart smart athlete in how he approached the game. And, and I, I kind of sponged off him and, and um, when you see things enough, you kind of start recognizing little, uh, little triggers on the court of what, how plays might develop. Yeah. And uh, especially being a, the slower player on the court, it's important to anticipate things happening so that you are able to, to defend the other team's best players. So, um, you know, some, sometimes it's just an educated guess in, in how things will develop and where you might need to be. But right. I think that comes from um, uh, continuing to, to actively educate myself on the sport and, and how the sport's changing and, and how athletes are doing things differently, but, but trying to, to, you know, stay, um, stay up at the top of the game by educating myself with that. Yeah. Do you do much reflection on your game or is it kind of, you just want to get to the next one? I know you've spoke about video. Any- I, I, I don't think you do much reflection on games within the tournament setting. I just don't think there's enough time. Yeah. Uh, some, some tournaments are, are compact and you're playing two games a day and, and other tournaments like maybe world championships or the, the Paralympics, you have one game a day, but, you're still playing the next day where once that game's over, you got to start focusing on, on the next team you're playing. So I think a lot of the reflection and a lot of breaking down your own gameplay and, and yourself as an athlete comes at those times when you're, you're at home, right? You're not with the team training. Um, those, that time when you are together is so precious where you need to be focused on the certain technical 
tactical aspects that your team needs to work on. So a lot of that's probably done at home uh, on my own time. Yeah. And so you're co-captain. How do you compartmentalize those roles? Is it good cop, bad cop? Or is it you kind of, uh, <laughs> you kind of have specific areas? Yeah, it's probably more uh, good cop, bad cop. Uh, <laughs> so Pico, co-captain, um, is uh, an amazing player and, and a very smart player as well. We're both one-pointers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's... He, he's very driven as an athlete. So he, having him at my side, uh, you know, helps push me to be a better athlete as well. And then, um, I know I can be loud. I can be vocal. I can be very emotional and I can come off probably angry or frustrated at times. Mm -hmm. and, and Pico really helps ground me. He's, uh, he, he's, he's the calm in the storm, I guess you could say. Yeah, and, uh, I think we we balance each other very well. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you come across so so chilled and nonchalant, but I, I you know watching you play, I can definitely see how they you get that white line fever as soon as you cross there. You're you're into it with a four v four game. I mean, I guess you got to be like that, hey? Yeah, I mean, I I uh, I've been able to use that um, to really. Um, straddle that line and, and and I think it's helped me be be a, a better athlete on the court playing with that intensity and, and that level of grit um, and uh, I know being conscious of not going too far and taking mm -hmm. myself out of the game is is something that I'm aware of um, but yeah I think uh when in a in a four v four game, it's important to to that you're you're on task whenever you're on the court. Um, there's not a lot of room to hide out there, so if you're not on task and focused, uh, you're not going to be on the court that long. You're going to find yourself uh, on the bench watching and supporting differently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the world game now it's it's so tight. There's a lot of parity. So, you know, does that motivate you guys? Does it make you a bit nervous? You know, how does that affect uh, the team? I think it's great for the sport. I think for the team, it's... Uh, it, I think you see how important it is to constantly grow within the sport. You can't just, um, you know, say that, yeah, we had, we had a great year last year and, and that's going to bring us through to the next year uh, teams are very much on equal playing grounds these days. You've got a lot of amazing athletes around the world and a lot of games are the top level games. The, the podium finish games are going to overtime and that's just how close um, these teams are matched up. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and it's such a, for those who haven't seen a game, I, you know, just tune in. I mean, your qualifying game is, is something to see. And with the Paralympics being shifted now, how has that affected the mindset of, of the group? And as a captain, have you had to be a sense of support there? Um, I think in the beginning with the Paralympics being postponed, um, there was maybe a bit of... Um, disappointment from some of the guys who maybe it was their first chance to represent Canada at the Paralympics. Yeah. Um, I know for, uh, sorry, we just got one of the babies woke up. Uh, we, uh, for a lot of the, the veteran guys, um, I think we see it as an opportunity to, to really take this time just to focus on the Paralympics and, and Tokyo in 2021. Um, I think uh, right now, obviously, not being able to gather, not training, not really knowing um, the future as to when that um, might start again. There's a little um, anxiety and a little anxiousness, but I think in general, um, having basically a full year to focus on one event mm -hmm. is pretty rare uh, when you look at uh, most years, the first opportunity to qualify for 
for uh, Tokyo was in August and and that was at in Lima for us and we finished second so we didn't qualify there the US did because uh, and we didn't actually qualify till March mm. which um, you know you're spending August to March focusing on trying to qualify instead of focusing yeah. on the Paralympics so I think having that opportunity to to really put all our energy into that one tournament uh, will be beneficial for us. Yeah, I was in a webinar last night with Dr. Sean Taylor and um, just exactly what you're saying. The one thing about firstly realizing what's going on and there's, uh, there's an awareness of, you know, it's a big impactful, maybe negative thing that's happened, but also being able to realign it. Right now I've got a year or, or however, however, how long may it be. Now I've got a year to really sort out my game, um, set some new goals, some challenges. You know, a varsity athletes are being told, some athletes, that there's not going to be a season. So I think it's a good message for, to people out there that you can realign your goals and have some positivity about it. Oh, of course. And uh, I think I've done stuff like that as well. And just focusing on, you know, some of the areas that, that I want to, to improve in physically and, and mentally. And, and I have that time to do it now. Sometimes it's tough to do uh, in season where you're, you're kind of peaking periodically throughout the year where you can't put a big chunk of time into, you know, really trying to get stronger or faster or, or really focusing on uh, different aspects of the game. So uh, yeah. I'm trying to, to make the best of it and come out of it, you know, I know a better athlete than, than how I, I went into it and uh, it's kind of, kind of where I'm at with it. So let's delve into that. What's your, what does your training look like? What's a, what's a day in my life right now? And how have you adjusted uh, during the pandemic? Yeah, obviously. So uh, gyms have been closed and uh, I'm not, I hadn't been seeing my trainer that I worked with and the court that I had been using was uh, closed. So I had to be creative. Uh, I ended up finding a storage unit close to my house that's outside and it's about a, a 10 foot by 20 foot storage unit. And I got uh, a hand cycle in there. I threw down some of the, the kids mats on the ground. So it was like a matted floor. Nice. Ended up renting some weights from the gym that I went to because yeah. they were renting out some of the equipment they were using. And uh, rowing Canada lent me a rowing erg with an adaptive seat. So mm. I have all that stuff in there. I got a bunch of bands and stuff. And then the grounds of the, the storage unit is actually asphalt and, and pretty big. So they said that I can push all over a place in there. So I got some medicine balls, some, some rugby balls to throw in and some cones. So, you know, I got, I got a pretty good setup where I can get there daily anytime I want it's 24 hours so I mean if it doesn't work out during the day just based on the kids schedule once when they pop them down to bed I can you know pop up there in the evening especially being the summer and, and a little nicer the the daylight's a little longer so as long as that's it's so dry cool. I can push out nice way to think outside the box there that's that's really cool good to hear as well I mean you know you can do anything uh, if, if people really put their mind to it yeah, and I think that's that's probably one of the biggest challenges for most athletes right now is 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 not the cancellation or the postponement of of different things, but finding different ways to maintain their training. Uh, it's such an important part of their lives and their routine and their daily schedules that um, you know it's it's. They, they need to find a way to to maintain that and and it's important to be creative and you see tons of different athletes through social media mm -hmm. um, finding ways to be creative at home or or close to home and how are you structuring your diet right now is it different uh, very much or are you pretty are you pretty structured within that or are you kind of not pretty relaxed about that well so after the qualifier in uh, in march there and all the the COVID went down and 
lockdown and whatnot, we decided, my wife and I decided just to go vegetarian. So I'm probably, I have a hard time doing a hundred percent. So I'm maybe about 90% vegetarian Mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, you know, I I do enjoy a piece of meat here and there, but uh, you know, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed, uh, I like cooking. I've always liked cooking. So for me, it's that challenge of, of, you know, finding different recipes and and so opening up uh, that way and and learning different things that way. That's been fun. And uh, uh, my deli, my diets, you know, I'm trying to, to maintain my weight and, and not get too big. <laughs> yeah. Any, not- I, any, any notable differences that you feel from, from being a vegetarian now or 90% vegetarian? Uh, maybe energy. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Yeah. I feel good. Uh, I, I, I felt good before too. And maybe mm-hmm. it's just a change up, but mm-hmm. um. I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I'm eating a lot more salads and stuff, I guess, than I probably had before, which uh, isn't a bad thing. Not at all. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's talk about coaching now. Um, I'd like to um, delve into coaching side of things. One, the differences uh, that maybe you need in terms of uh, in your toolkit, maybe uh, to be a Paralympic coach, and also your own coaching. So two different pillars there that I'd like to talk about. Yeah. So I think uh, as far as being a Paralympic coach, some of the, some of the big things are, and I, I think it's just coaching in general is, is really taking the time to know your athletes. Mm. Um, sports are definitely come a long way since, you know, when I grew up playing sports and how coaches, um, communicated with athletes. Um, it's, it's really, you know, a lot more down to being, um, human and, and really, you know, taking the time to understand your athletes, how they're feeling, um, and, and really build a relationship that way first, I think, instead of, um, you know, focusing on, the success of a program. I think it really starts with the athletes now instead. And and I mean, uh, I remember growing up playing hockey where, I mean, you lost games or, or didn't play well. You, the next practice you're skating until you couldn't skate anymore or or what stuff like that. So bag skating. And then, and I think, the sports changed and, and sport in general has changed where yeah. it's, it's a lot more athlete focused and, and wellness focused. And I think that's, that's been healthy for our younger generation to, to, to feel that support from the program. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's, it's needed. And what mm-hmm. I like about the Canadian pathway uh, since coming here almost seven years ago is that whole theory element, that whole, um, the modules and the education out there where, you know, you've got to be a certain type of person and, and very aware before you step onto the court or the field and coach young people or peers. Yeah. Um, you recently did some coaching, right? How's that, how's that been going? It's been good. I actually, you know, had the opportunity last two weeks there to, to take the international coaching school. Nice. So I'm still educating myself, still learning. And, yeah. uh, I've been coaching the provincial team for the last three years. I'm having fun. It's definitely um, way different than being an athlete where um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to pass on my knowledge in, in how I see the sport and, and, and stuff. And, and it's exciting to see um, some of the younger athletes and the drive they have in, 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 the motivation they have in pursuing, you know, their national team goals. Well, you must be, that must be a great role model opportunity to see a, a oh. BT young team and the core captain of the national team coaching. I mean, that must be, and to hold back on them kids and not show them all the moves and the tricks that you know, that must be hard to do. Yeah. I, I, it's a big learning curve for me for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, trying to just, 
um, B, <laughs> be as, as, uh, as helpful as possible without overwhelming. Uh, yeah. I, I, I can get deep into things and I know that um, that's not the level I'm at. So it, it's it really uh, for me to, to be aware of, of how my athletes learn is, is important. And how are they doing now? Uh, how are they doing in, in isolation, uh, you athletes? Uh, I mean, isolation is tough. We're, we're trying to stay active as far as uh, range of motion, stretching, um, stuff like that. Uh, if they have access to equipment or we're able to get outside and push and do something to stay active daily. I think that's the main focus. The main focus right now is do something, anything to stay active mm -hmm. and really stay focused on maintaining your range of motion and your flexibility so that when we are able to get back to the season, we're not at risk of injuries and then having setbacks that way. So that's, that's really where we're at right now is just, um, doing anything to stay active and, and, and uh, with the uncertainty of when next season will start, uh, that's really all, all we have right now. Mm -hmm. So give us a, a, a bit of exposure around the pathway um, for some, for people who are not sure of it out there and how to connect. So what does the regional to provincial to national pathway look like? It is all over the place. So um, really, regionally, we have, uh, within BC, we have um, some programs scattered throughout the province yeah. that are basically there because there are maybe one or two uh, wheelchair rugby athletes there. Maybe more. We, we have a program out of Victoria. We have a program out of um, Kelowna. We have a program out of Vancouver. We had one in Squamish. <laughs> uh, we have one in Prince George. And um, so at, at, a, at a club level with that, um, they have tournaments throughout the year where the athletes will come in. And if they're in those different regional environments, they usually play for those. But a lot of those, like at Prince George, there's only two athletes there. So we'll use athletes from a bigger pool like Vancouver to, to fill out the rosters. And, and really that at that level is just getting introduced to the game and learning to love the sport mm -hmm. and, and, and making friends and, and just having fun. And then from there, there's the, the provincial side where uh, provincially BC has two teams. There's a development team where, a lot of the athletes making that step from that, that club level to the provincial level start out. And then there's um, the, the uh, BCA team or Div 1 team where um, that's usually the team that's um, filled with athletes that are uh, maybe in the next gen program for the national team or on the national team or in the development program for the national team, or they're, um, you know, made that, that first stride from the development team to the, the div one team. And then uh, <clears throat> from that provincial team, it goes straight into different national team programs where you have a next gen program um, where athletes from Canada are brought together um, and they work with coaches and their next step is in the national team program, either like uh, right now, I think we have 18 people in our program. Right. And most tournaments we only take, well, we take 12 to tournaments. You can only roster 12. So right. 18, 12 of those athletes are selected to, to various tournaments. And how much movement is there in the, in the teams? Uh, is, the, is the 12 quite set for the, for the year or whatnot? Or is there a little bit of movement within that? I would say nothing set. But it, and it's all based on um, performance and, and throughout the season. But 
I think the coaches have uh, a pretty good uh, idea of the athletes that they're going to bring and they have a, a good core group that they, they lean on. And based on the tournament um, and the level of, of uh, play at the tournament, they bring in other athletes to help, you know, get experience. And, right. And if it's a, a higher end tournament, maybe they bring in more of those, you know, those top 12 that might uh, be at your world championships or your Paralympics. And what I've noticed is there seems to be a good connection, <coughs> camaraderie, not just in teammates, but against opposition too. Like you guys go for it and smash each other all over the court, but then there's a lot of, there seems like a lot of respect. Do you think that's, because you've all been through a lot of adversity and struggle, do you think that's part of the connection in, in the sport? Maybe. It, it definitely probably has a little bit to do with it, but I think um, the sport in general, the athletes around the world, in ge- there's just the, the athlete pool is so small right? Um, that for most of your career, you're playing against the same guys right? where you're constantly going to battle against the same guys. So at some point that level of respect is, yeah. it has to be there, right? Where, yeah. You, you find you're constantly grinding it out against the same guys. So um, having that that respect is 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 earned. So I guess the main goal is for you to go out there and top that podium in a year's time, right? Yes, that's definitely the main goal. Uh, top the podium. Um, uh, it's been a dream of mine, and uh, it's definitely one of the factors that keeps pushing me to, to stay involved in the sport and grind it out and and continue to, to grow as an athlete. Well, I think that's a great way to to kind of wrap this up. And for any, anyone who's looking to get into the sport, uh, what would you recommend they do or what would you advise they connect with? I would recommend that they, they contact their, their provincial wheelchair sports organization. Or, you know, throw uh, an email out to Wheelchair Rugby Canada and they might be able to point you into to a direction based on where you are across the country. And my, uh, my boss, Catherine Edwards, good friend of mine as well, she would, uh, she would run me over the calls if I didn't mention uh, her, her awesome programs, which are, she's uh, led, um, I think you've been a part of the Wheel Kids programs. Uh, throughout the island over the last uh, couple of years and uh, uh, Catherine's done some enormously positive things so uh, and within now I think uh, I might be wrong here but I, I'm pretty sure that they're trying to get wheelchairs out to to folks that would want them on sport wheelchairs to, to people that need them during the pandemic so wheel kids check out those programs too um, they're happening in several communities across the across the uh, the region um, so that's also a good connection too yeah, enjoyed my time with them. Kids are great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I think that's pretty much it for us. Uh, that is episode seven of the Elevate Speaker Series. Uh, we're trying to churn these out and give people a break from the norm. Um, Trev, thanks so much, bud. It's really good to catch up. Amazing time. Thanks for having me. All right, take care. Thanks a lot.